Hi, everybody. Welcome to, oh, never mind. Well, hi, everyone on YouTube. We're going live on YouTube, and we're going to attempt to go live on Facebook here as well. We've got Katie Peterson here, and we'll be doing session two of three, still life painting. So in just a minute, I'll let her hop in and get started. Thanks for joining us today. You can leave comments. Uh, we may or may not get to the YouTube ones. This is our first YouTube live. So we will see how things go. We have them responding to the Facebook comments, so you'll get to hear those questions. And then if I do ever glance up and see any questions on the YouTube side, uh, I'll try and answer those quickly uh, if I do glance up. Yes, thank you all for joining us today. We're starting the uh, part two of this series, and we're going to be working on our underpainting just as soon as we get the Facebook Live set up, which we thought we had, but it did not go. All right. All right, everybody, we had to try that twice, but I think we've got it going. Katie Peterson is here for session two of three, Still Life Painting. You're going to learn lots today, lots about uh, underpainting. And so yeah. I'm just going to throw it over to her. We're also uh, filming on YouTube Live, so enjoy. Hi, everyone. So thank you for coming today for part two of the series that we're doing. So now we're going to start our underpainting and we have a lot to do today. So I'm actually going to later on put in our artists that I will be talking about in the description or in the description or in the comments uh, so you can look at them later. So, uh, so for today, we're gonna to be learning actually the Grisai method of underpainting. And what that, and Grisai, the word Grisai comes from the word gray, so it is a gray underpainting. We're more of sculpting and focusing on the tones, the tones and values of our still life rather than the color. So this is actually kind of the opposite opposite of what I usually work with, but, but, but you always want to start with an underpainting. Uh, most people do, but so I'm very excited to show you this today. And this is actually a very old technique. Uh, our artists today are Hubert von Eyck and John von Eyck. The piece I'll be talking about is the Ghent altar piece, and the Ghent altar piece is made out of, is painted on wood with tempera, and they use the grisaille technique on the Ghent alt, altar piece, and they they were they're Flemish, and they started working in, uh, I believe, the 15th century Northern Renaissance, but the Ghent altar piece is actually a polyaptic uh, altar piece where there are four doors, I believe, that open up, but on the front side of the doors, there's just a gray painting, and that's what our Grisaille painting will look like once we're finished, but when you open it, when they open it, you'll see this beautiful colored uh, tempera painting, but so, and that will look, will, is what our paintings will look like at, at the end of part three, where, where we already have the Grisaille painting, but then we're gonna brush over our color. So uh, I'll add that in a little bit later since we just have, we have a lot to do today, a lot to do. So I'm gonna start getting started. And usually, so for a preside painting, you want, you can use gray, you can use black and white, that's fine. Uh, you can also use muted colors. So I'm mostly probably looking at my still life, I see a lot of cooler shadows um, around the oranges and the limes. So I'm going to be using a Haynes Gray. I might use some Van Dyke Brown or the, the teacup part because that, that feels like a warmer shadow. But so if you really so if you really want to, you can try and pick out those warmer and cooler shadows. But for mostly for a grisaille painting, you you want to use muted colors. So 
and usually before most usually when we start this with students uh, we usually have them create a value scale uh, so they'll have you know their darkest value as a nine their lightest value which would be white as a one you know we'll meet in the middle what is the, the middle value and then we'll we'll fill in the gaps between there but I don't have one with me today so but so what I'm first going to start doing is I'm going to establish my darkest areas of the theme, um, mostly for me to see kind of what I'm working with. I'm going to go from my darkest to my lightest, and then start filling in those middle tones, almost like what we do with the value scale. So I'm just using pure Haynes Gray. I'm not really adding much. To it, actually, I take that back. I might add just a little bit to it, just so. Because really, the purpose of an underpaint is to build up our canvas. You know, we don't want to see we don't want to see the canvas underneath. Uh, it's okay to see some of the tooth of it. That's that's fine. But we, we want it to look like you know there's a nice solid coverage of it. So I'm gonna go in. I still like holding it here. Okay, I'll just flash it again. I'd say around here, probably one of my darkest values. And I'm going to come in with a little bit more of my paint gray. Again, for the first time ever, we're also cross-videoing this at YouTube Live. So if you have any friends that don't have Facebook, let them know they can access us at YouTube Live as well. Working on your own piece, we would love to see updates. You can send them to the gallery or share them via Facebook, Instagram. And kind of like I talked about in the first painting demo that I did, is that you always want to keep on moving around the canvas. You don't really want to stay in one spot for too long. Otherwise, then you can start getting. Switch to a bigger brush for that area. For anyone new to paint, too, before we went live, Katie and I were discussing this method, and she was uh, telling me that it's something that many students would learn in like the painting. Yes, yeah, so this is a really nice way to learn about value. And we're not, we're more of like sculpting rather than uh, painting or like coloring. That's interesting. What do you mean by sculpting? So we're thinking about only the light and the shadows. Uh, we're not thinking about color yet. It's very similar to, I guess, you know, if you're working in 3D, you're thinking about, you know, the form rather than the surface. Yeah, pretty much. So this this style of underpainting is it pretty much does all of the hard work for us. So now we're going to you start adding color, all we have to do is brush it on. And then so I, I pretty much have 
all of my darkest areas pretty much done. But I'm going to actually add a little bit of black into here and start adding some down here just so we can start moving a little bit faster. Normally I would build that up with just the paint, just the paint spray, but for these purposes I'm just going to start going to add some black in just so we can start moving this a little bit quicker. away from it for so long. I okay, missed it. Tell the viewers why. Um, I think you might have been the last class, but if in case they weren't tuned in, why you've been away from black. So I love black with all of my heart. You know, I wear a lot of it. Um, but it just, but I tend to overuse it. Uh, so I, I have an, I used to have kind of addiction to it almost, I would say. Um, so I, so my professor, one of my professors, you know, she just said, okay, you know, she took away my black <laughs> and, um, I was a little bit heartbroken, but you know, but I had to learn how to use color and, you know, and eventually I kind of became more of a colorist. You know, I, I use pure color instead of using black. If I'm going with a darker tone, I'm usually going to use like a Van Dyke brown or a Payne's gray rather than a black. Or I will use my complementary colors rather than a black because you can really get some really rich dark darkness with just your complementary colors that and it just because black kind of, it's very flat, you know, it just stops everything out. And that's why it looks really beautiful with like print making. If you're doing like a black and white print, you know, it's very graphic and it's beautiful. But for painting, you know, if, if a lot of times, you know, I'm, don't, I'm not really looking for that in my paintings. It might be a little bit too harsh with some of the colors that I have chosen. So, you know, it, it was the right decision for me to leave it out. Right now, I actually took a little bit of my Van Dyke brown and some white. I'm kind of filling in kind of this lighter black area. So we're only using black for the very darkest, darkest parts. Looks like we have Linda Williams and Kyle Mock joining us. Huh? anyone watching via YouTube Live or Facebook Live, let us know if you're just kind of watching and maybe you'll do the project later or you're just learning or maybe you're actually, you're, uh, actually painting along with Katie. We'd love to know how you're doing. Jennifer Benson just joined us. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. So again, we're doing YouTube Live this time, as well as Facebook Live. And we're on session two of three yes. sessions. So as you can see today, Katie's getting some paint on the canvas, and this is what she has termed underpainting. Yep. But yeah, we're building up our canvas, because we don't want to see uh, the canvas showing through our paint. I usually do an underpainting with a color, uh, with my values, but this time we're doing a grisaille technique. So this is very exciting. It's good to do different things. You learn a lot. And kind of the goal for again for our underpainting is to fill up, is to cover the canvas as quickly as possible. You know, we're using our big brushes first, and then we're going smaller as we go into our deep 
detail. But you know, we want to get rid of that white of the canvas as quickly as possible, at least for me, because I get I get white canvas anxiety. You know, I'm like, gosh, you know, like, what if I mess up? You know, I don't want to ruin this perfect, you know, white canvas. But the best way to do that is just to cover up the whole thing as fast as you can. <laughs> at least I personally think so. And move it. It is only paint, so it can be uh, modified if you have a perfect light, right? Yes. Yeah, like in here, there's kind of like this outlet switch. I'm I'm gonna take that out. I'm I don't really think it serves any purpose to the overall overall um, composition. It's not important. So I. I'm gonna cut it out. It's in the background, anyways. Now, a lot of a lot of students that I've had, you know, like they have like an object, like a glass object or something that's very intricate, like rope, and they're like, "Gosh, you know, do I have to?" Yes, yes, you do. <laughs> but but I'm not being graded on this, <laughs> so or maybe I am. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. And eventually I'll probably go back into some of these areas as I'm going along and start adding in more of those detailed values. But right now I want to get, like I said, I want to cover up as fast as I can. And when you say detailed values, you're talking about like adding additional Yeah, values. yeah, just little details, you know, like if I want to add like the little stems to this, or maybe there's kind of like a little, kind of a little shadow that would come right down here. I'm going to wait until this is a little bit drier, maybe a little bit more tacky, and add like maybe some black. I like that. It kind of breaks it down and makes it seem mm -hmm. a little more doable. Absolutely. we got to make it easy for us. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then also with this method, a lot of people are like, well, you know, my, my brightest highlights are my whites. You know, can I just leave that on the canvas? No. Use white paint. It'll look, it'll look a lot more finished, a lot more uh, professional. So I know that tiny little highlight here, so I'm just going to mark that off really quick. One here. So I keep in mind. Eventually, so now I'm going to start blending. Usually, uh, you want to blend with your palette knife because otherwise you can get you can ruin your brush and you can get paint in here and it's really hard to clean up. So I'm going to start blending some of my paints gray into some more white. We're starting to establish those middle tones. Matthews and Denise will be joining in. Hi Denise, I think I just talked to you last week. I hope you're getting lots of painting done over this quarantine pandemic period. So again, we're on YouTube Live today as well as Facebook Live. If you have any friends that don't do Facebook, they're welcome to join our Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Fremont Area Art Association. Always wanted to be a famous YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> well, we decided when Katie and I decided to do some virtual classes, we decided, and we, neither of us had done them. We thought, well, if we make some huge blunders, we will probably just go viral and be, you know, it's a win-win. Yeah, YouTube <laughs> viral sensation. We're in session two of three, so today Katie is tackling the underpainting. And as she just mentioned a little bit ago, she's not getting real into the details. She can go back and, and kind of tackle those later. Yep, I'm just kind of, I'm really following what I drew. I'm following my drawing a lot from kind of where I blocked off the shadows. 
kind of just feel like in those places. Which, you know, I'm usually, I'm very bad with with my drawings, you know, like, I like to, I kind of, I tend to rush through them, but I'm really, really thankful for, for taking the time to do really nice detailed line drawing because that, that's helping me out a lot right now. Alright, so we're kind of just starting to change this circle into a sphere. Uh, we're thinking about the lighting that's being right in here. Um, we're having some some lighting that is bouncing back kind of here. Um, we're going to have light that will get here and then bounce off of there. So, really, you know, it's again, it's a lot about breaking it down into simple shapes. This is just a sphere right now. This isn't an orange yet. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get there. We will. A reminder that last week's session is on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. There's no session next Wednesday, but we will follow up July 29th. Yeah, this is this will be a lot for one for one sitting. So if we want to give you as much time, you know, to, to get to get through this other thing because this is probably where there's just a lot. Where there's the most action happening. There's a lot happening in this stage. Right now I'm kind of going back in with the, my really dark paint gray, my darkest paint gray that I can get in. Going over to this shadow right here by my orange because it is pretty sharp. But a lot of times, remember, uh, if you want to make things look darker or lighter, it's through contrast. So with my with my light right here, I might add just a little bit of a dark, just kind of put right here. You can actually see that a little bit of my a little bit dark right in there. That will actually make my highlight look a little brighter. I'm starting to kind of overwork this orange now, so I think it's about time to move over to this one. And I'll go back and refine what I have there. So I'm moving on over to this line. Dark tones, so just like we did with our new map, we're kind of establishing the tones. Now we're going to have any questions for Katie, feel free to leave a comment. I will read it off to her. And you know, if you don't really have any questions about what we're talking about right now, Oh, you know, that's okay too. If you maybe just have a question about general themes, you know, any questions for me? Because I like talking. <laughs> well, no, if you, if you guys have noticed this, I like talking. More than I probably shouldn't. 
Mm -hmm. Kind of with this line, you do have kind of these yellow spots. So I'm going to keep those pretty light. like a rough a rough shading of our spheres. Might add a little bit of the board the little stem just so I know where the water is. I don't know. Gonna do one underneath the ground this one and another here. Gonna start with this one over here. So we have, we still do have you know, very sharp shadows right here, establishing our darks. And it kind of, it kind of gradually gets lighter as as we go out. I think that's because there's light reflecting bouncing back from the tip here. So. We're going to add in one of our little values. And then there is kind of this implied line right here that's kind of like this white highlight. And, and it's going to show up really nice against what we have here with the black because white and black are, are complementary shades, really. Just, just like blue and orange and red and green and purple and yellow, which is why they look so great together. Looks like Gary Pearson just joined us. Hi, Gary. Right. Questions or comments for Katie? It can be covering um, a still life painting or just painting in general or art in general. Or maybe if you have any questions from the lap from part one that we did, it's all good too. Maybe if you didn't see part one, you can ask about the drawing in general. So then we're going to start, we're going to have, looks like we still have some middle tones here. Our highlight will be around here. To mix up a little bit more. Using our palette knife, using good, good painting habits. I usually just mix with my brushes. Do what I say, not what I do. I also need to clean my brushes more. Oh well, but like, you know, I use them a lot. You know, I use them almost every day. You know, they're not really sitting in my solvents for very long. So far why they've lasted a little surprisingly long, I think. <laughs> How long do you spend each day painting? Uh, you know, I'm kind of working on printmaking for a class right now, so I, I've been kind of uh, taking a break from painting. But you know, when I'm I'm going, you know, I have I'm I'm creating paintings, so I'm you know just like I'm just knocking them out. You know, I I could spend about maybe seven hours. You know, I'll maybe spend like two hours on one, 
and then switch over to the other one when I need a break. But that's when I, that's when I was working on my, my senior show for undergrad. You know, I, 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 there was a lot of time, a lot of time in the studio, a lot of late nights, but you know, that's where I would want to be anyways. You know, I, it, it doesn't really feel like work. So I'm really, I'm really thankful for that. I'm really thankful that I found something that, that you know, if I, if I do work, you know, at eight o'clock at night, you know, until midnight, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm draining myself. But granted, but like you, with most, most creative people in in any field, I feel like, you know, whether that be music, art, dance, you know, we, we as creators, we do need a break every once in a while to recharge, otherwise we can get burnt out. So we do have to be careful of that and mindful of that. It's kind of a highlight. Quite a lot of kind of making that one shadow really calm. But, but, you know, so I've been kind of taking a break from painting and I've been working on printmaking, which I really, really enjoy. Right now we're learning about screen printing. So that's pretty fun. Let us know if you're following along. Maybe we have some seasoned painters out there that even have some tips for painting. Yes. That would be interesting to hear. I always, I'm always looking to learn more because I don't know everything. I'm still learning. You know, I think, I think that's one of the nice things about life or art. You know, you just, you never stop learning. I think it keeps things interesting. Because, you know, we can always be better. I have this implied line right here. It's kind of the opposite of here. You know, we have kind of this lighter area right here. So we're going to have this implied dark line right here. This is anyone else, but I don't, what do you guys do? You guys listen to music when you're doing art or working. I, I do too, but you ever just like feel like you run out of songs or you play one song like 50 times throughout the whole day? Because I've definitely done that. What's one of your favorite songs to play? Oh, shoot. Um, you know, I've always been a big Lady Gaga fan, <laughs> so I play a lot of her stuff. No, she was the first album I've ever owned. You know, but like, you know, I've, I've listened to all kinds of stuff though. I, you know, I've, I've listened to, uh, I've listened to classical, because uh, I actually just took a, a music class last semester that introduced me to classical music and helped me understand and appreciate it quite a few things that I really, really like now. Um, I've, listened, I've listened to instrument music from like video games that I've seen my friends play. I've heard that video game music makes you concentrate more. And sometimes if I'm feeling distracted, I'll put that on. Hopefully that will make me focus. <laughs> I get distracted very easily. All right, so that one's looking about done. I think I'm going to start doing some of the poems in the background. Okay. You know, I got paints gray on my brush still, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to work on the background, kind of the bluish areas. Got to keep the ball moving.
So I want to know your guys' opinion about this. So what do you guys feel about brush strokes? You know, me personally, a little bit under refined, but you know, there's also a lot of value in really smooth, really refined paint. But sometimes when I tend to do that, I tend to overwork my. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Personal taste. Again, we're establishing, establishing our darkest tones. You know, it's almost like a pattern. You go dark to lightest, and you fill it, you just fill it in. That yeah, came off my brush really well. You're just joining us. We're in session two of three part session with Katie Peterson, a virtual still life painting class, working on the underpainting today. This is actually pretty light in the background, but I think it's going to look beautiful and really make the shadow in here pop. Go in with the bigger brush. You know, I've heard a lot of advice that it's good to kind of switch switch up your brushes. Don't stick with one brush for too long. I tend to do that. You know, I have I have a favorite brush. What are the benefits of switching it up? So, you know, again, like if you're working in a big area with a little teeny brush, you know. Like I was kind of doing, I started doing that in here before I caught myself. Uh, you know, just some brushes are filled different spaces better. Um, usually, filbert brush, you know, that's really nice if you're doing like curves. This brush is doing is really nice for doing uh, straight lines. The one for curves, you said, is a filbert brush. Uh, filbert. 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 Yeah. Can you show them? I think it was actually this brush right here. It's kind of a tapered, oh, okay. tapered edge right there. This one now that we're doing like always kind of want to straight up the brush. Like you're using a lot of the wrist while you're... Yeah, yeah, it just, you know, to kind of like get this movement just to fill in spaces a little bit quicker. And I, I need to, I just realized I need to darken up one of my areas real quick. Kind of get more of that definition. I didn't really want a lot of sharpness in there because I'm just doing kind of going down the fold to that line. I want to blend in a little bit of the line. So in the underpainting, will you strictly be using these two colors? Yeah, yeah, I like. I'm mostly going to be using the paint spray, but my most of my shadows I'd say are cooler. You know, they have more blue tones. Uh, so when I do do the final coats, it'll have like a blue undertone to it. It also will, will look nice because or orange and blue are complementary colors. But actually, for the teacup, I'm actually probably going to use. I'm probably still going to use a little bit of paint gray in here and here, 
but for most of it, I'm probably going to switch over to my Van Dyke Brown just to give it a little bit more warmth. Because I remember I used a warm light on the still light. So the white is reflecting that, those kind of those orange and yellow colors. So if someone is new to painting, for the underpainting process, do you recommend just like one or two colors? You know, to keep it simple, yeah. You know, if you want to do this whole still life with just black and white, you definitely black and white. You definitely could. Uh, I don't think there's as much like what's the word? I don't know if it could if it's going to have like that much color depth at the very end. But you definitely could, and I've seen lots of people do it. But. But yeah, definitely stick with just, you know, your neutral colors, your neutral tones, like a Van Dyke brown and a Payne's gray or a black and a white. Definitely need white. White is a must. <laughs> but you aren't using white today, right? I am, yes, okay. definitely. Yep. Yep. All the all of these tones are just pretty much made using Payne's gray and white. And I use a little bit of black and by Van Dyke Brown down here. Yeah. If you're watching, we hope to see what you've learned, maybe via a comment or maybe a share what you're working on. It could be a still life like Katie's or maybe you set up your own still life. We'd love to see it. So now we're going to start filling in the lights and little tones. It's open here. That was really nice highlight right here. But I accidentally had a very broad. So that's kind of more of a middle tone, but eventually when it dries, I can still go back in and add in those stripes. And I might even add, go back in a couple times before I'm done with my underpainting to make sure that they are the, the brightest brights and the darkest darks, just to really get that beautiful contrast and that value in there. Because a lot of times with value and still life, um, you know, it's, the va it's different values that make the painting really interesting. Can you talk a little about, a bit about what value is for anyone? Completely yeah, different. so value is, is the different shades of, of, um, of, our, of our scale, of our value scale. So our value scale, so we'll have white at one end and our darkest dark at, one, at another end. And all of those shades in between those are our values that we would use. Oh, again, I think I mentioned this before, but a lot of times, you know, with new students, we will usually have them create a value scale. And, um, and that, that really helps us picture it. And usually we have it like right here, so they can be like, okay, for one mid, for this mid-tone right here, I would use maybe a three. So it's almost like an ombre of color to me. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's a definitely a gradation of our of our values of like the lightest lights to the darkest dark. And when they do that, do you have them start with the lightest, or do you have them start with the darkest? So usually we'll have them do start with the lightest and then the darkest at one end. And then we'll do our middle tone, which is equal light, equal dark. And then we'll fill in the gaps. You know, we'll start from the middle tone to the darkest, fill in those gaps from the lightest to the darkest, fill those gaps. Because a lot of people uh, have tried doing that, but they'll find out like, oh, I could have put in one more shade in, or actually, you know, that's not, it's not the smoothest gradation as it could have been, or I could even go go darker than what I have or I run out of spaces. So it, so that, that kind of helps, you know, starting out at both ends, going to the middle and then filling in our spaces. Are they usually about the same um, 
gradients between dark and light? The same number of them? Oh, or? yeah, yeah. You could you can make it work. So um, is it like maybe like, like there's really numbers? there's really infinite numbers. Okay. Um, usually. For most painters, you know, usually we stick with about nine or twelve. But again, you, there's infinite numbers. Um, but maybe for a beginning painter, they can yeah. do nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do like nine boxes. I know what I'm trying tonight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and sometimes we get painters that have painted before and they're like, value scale, why do I need to do that? You know, that's, that's a really simple, really simple study. But, you know, even even as been painting, you know, I did my senior show of paint with painting. You know, I still like having value scale around. It looks like you're getting a lot of it covered. Absolutely, yeah. We're just we're, we're kind of jumping in. You know, it doesn't have to be quite perfect. I want I want to be. It, it has to be nice. Obviously, you know, you have to know. What we're looking at, so I, when I go back and start doing more of those fine details, I know what I'm. I know what I'm looking at. It makes it really clear and easier for me. But we're filling. We're filling it in pretty quickly. So I'm going to start using the start on the teeth cup because I have most most of this mid area, this mid mid area done. I'm going to save this because it. I, I'm just probably going to use paint gray on this part. I might use the background on this part, but I'm going to start it because I don't have this big open space. And Trajan's joining us again. Hello. If you're just joining us, we've got session two of our three part series with Katie Peterson, Still Life Painting. Today she's focusing on the underpainting. Last week was the drawing on the canvas. Now we're doing the underpainting. So not paying attention to a ton of details, but get, starting to get the underpainting on the canvas. Yeah. And eventually we, we will go in with with our details and start adding those in. But right now we're, we're just trying to block on our values. Because um, ideally we do just want to be able to just brush over our color. We kind of have a warm shadow here. There is a cool Queen's gray shadow kind of right in here that I will get. If you have questions or comments for Katie, let us know. It could be about the still like painting series or just painting or art in general. Or Lady Gaga. We realized yes, that she was really a fan of Lady Gaga too. Wow. I'm also cross filming on YouTube Live if you have any friends that are not. Facebook numbers. You know, I liked Lady Gaga probably since 2010 when I was 12 years old. She's always been a favorite of mine. Have you ever painted her? No, no, no. Um, I usually, I usually don't do a lot of celebrity portraits. Um, it's not really where my focus is right now. Grisaille means gray, 
we want this is going to be a gray painting. So we're really only going to have like some warm grays, cool grays, and then there's more of our neutral grays made out of our black. And then ideally, once we have the underpaint done, we should just be able to brush on our color without having to, to really mix very much. And this is great to learn about the form of our different shapes. Because really, these are just spheres. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are like, okay, you know, I can draw a circle. But when you put, like, say, like an orange or something in front of them, they're like, gosh, you know, like, it's orange. Like, this, this is going to be a little bit harder. Just remember, just remind yourself that, that this, is, this is just a sphere. We're looking at it as a sphere. This isn't orange yet. Once we put, like, the color orange on it, it might be an orange. <laughs> but we're not there yet. We're just focusing on adding in our values. I like that idea of breaking it down into steps. Mm -hmm. Just want to give a shout out to Ryan Panette who's joining us. And Mom, Mary Peterson. Hi, Mom. If you're following along, let us know. Or maybe you, um, you just wanted to check out the video to see what he's up to. Leave us a comment or a question. We're really grateful to have the opportunity to do things like virtual classes in this very unique period where we can't necessarily gather in groups. Yes, doing these classes has brought me so much joy. I still couldn't sleep last night. I practiced what I would say in the shower. That's how excited I'm, I'm always, I'm always am. I know Kitty Hogan is out there following along today. And she's actually doing a watercolor. Ooh, nice. Very cool. So I'm afraid I don't I'm not too experienced with watercolor, that's something that I am working on, but I don't know if this method would apply because one of the great things about oil paint and paint is that you can see what's underneath of it, you know, and, uh, you, you work in layers. And I know in watercolor you work in layers too, but I don't know if it's to the same effect that we'll see, but and I think with acrylic painting, I've only done acrylic few times back in high school. Uh, you, acrylic dries pretty fast, but you can still do a grisaille painting with your acrylic. But I believe when you do go back over with your color, I think you have to add some kind of medium to kind of slow it down and to slow down the drying process and I think to make it thinner, I don't know, and like more brush brushable. I don't know, I don't know if you use water. I feel like when I was back in high school, and we were using acrylic, we used kind of this gel medium that kind of made it more oil paint-esque. Reminder to Gallery 92 members, if you're a member of the Fremont Area Art Association, next month we'll start our all-member show and actually I think uh, as of yesterday, it sounds like we might be hanging it through September. Mm -hmm. So um, if you are working on a piece, we would love to see it. If you're not a member and maybe you're working on something, it's super easy. Just give us a call or send us an email to the gallery or stop in. It's midway through the year, so a um, great time to do that. Yeah, or maybe if you want to enter one of the pieces that you're working on here, that could be exciting. I'd love to see that, you know, and if, I want to, and if you do have like work in progress pictures that you would like to share, you know, please, please tag us either on Instagram or share it through, with us on Facebook. I'm sure a lot of us really love to see what you're working on. So I do have a little bit of our design 
I kind of have this flower design. I'm not really going too much into detail of that. It's more of just like a very faint detail. I'll probably eventually blend it out just a little bit more. Because I don't know if it's really that important to the composition right now. We have a question if this is the yes. same still life from last time. It is. It is the same still life. Yes, the drawing that I worked on last time this is the second step to what I was working on last time. So yes, it's kind of fun to build it off of each other. I know a lot of people really enjoy seeing works like the work in progress. And seeing how it kind of changes throughout the process, that's fun. It's very bright and highly. That's okay. We can still go back and add it in. I start defining the value of this. It's a really nice state of paint, you know, there's it's kind of rain outside. I don't know if any of you guys ever get into just There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Guess we can't cut that out. Not live. But it shows that it is live. And That's exciting. Drop my cap, please. I have butter fingers. I tend to drop my paintbrushes. Luckily, I haven't spilled my solvent. Actually, no, I take that back. I was moving a table once and it just spilled everywhere. The whole, whole classroom smelled like the cancel. It just smelled flammable. <laughs> yeah, that was a great. But accidents happen. That's right. I'm starting to find the wood of this part. I'm just using nice, nice little movements. Oh, get that straight line in there. I have these warm shadows in here. I think Elijah Swanson might be watching on YouTube and not over there to check. But if so, hi Elijah. Hello. You know, and speaking about simple shapes, you know, that, it, you know, learning how to draw spheres and thinking of things as spheres and squares and ovals. You know how that you can tell yourself that it's just a circle or it's just a square. That helps you start drawing, you know, a lot or drawing and painting more complicated things and breaking down more complicated objects into their most simplest parts like the human like the human face, you know, the human face is mostly just a circle and then a square or a softer softer square if it's a woman's face. This is 
when I whenever I'm doing starting with like a portrait and I'm drawing in someone's face, I always I always do start with a circle for kind of where like the, the head and kind of where the brain would sit. You know, I'm doing part of the eyes, kind of like this area right in here, to be a sphere. I'm thinking about the volume of the head, like I would a sphere. And I've learned that that really helps me a lot. Thirty two, so we'll probably wrap things yes. up. Yes. Well we got a lot done today. I'm gonna go home and finish up this this painting really quickly really quickly and then I'm gonna post it to my Instagram and then I'm gonna give it one a picture of it to Angie and she can post it and then you guys can see oh, what a finished design painting will look like. So well thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing your paintings and hearing any comments, and I look forward to seeing you all on the 29th to where we will finish up our painting. We're gonna start brushing in our color, and then I'm also gonna bring in a, a, a painting that I did the first episode of the portrait. I'm gonna teach you guys how to clean up our borders and add a varnish, so that way, and add a varnish, so it's ready to show. Uh, you know, it's, it's done, it's finished, so. Thank you all, and thank you to Gallery 92 West for having me here. Thank you, Katie. Thanks yes. for joining us, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> nice job. Katie, go and show me her.